Thank you. Thank you guys very much for coming. This is, this is, this is an awesome room. Um, my name is John Birdsall, and I'm going to be sort of asking questions of these guys. Um, I'm a food writer in Oakland, and uh, I am terrified of, like, science. Um, <laughs> so in some ways, I'm kind of, uh, I'll be like the, like the devil's advocate. Um, but, but it's no pose. I'm actually uh, quite intimidated by science and quite impressed by, uh, by what these guys have done. Um, so I'd like to, oh, and um, I guess just some practical things. So we'll be talking on stage uh, until about 12.30, and then we will take uh, questions from you guys. And I hear there's going to be some people with uh, some microphones um, who, will, who will ask the questions. So we'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> and then I guess afterwards, outside, Kenji is going to be uh, doing a book signing. Um, so that will happen at about um, 1 o'clock outside. Great. So I wanted to introduce these two gentlemen. Um, at the end is Adam Rogers. He's a deputy editor of Wired. Uh, he edits features for the print magazine and manages the editing of long-form stories for the digital edition. Um, he had a feature called The Angel's Share, which is a detective story, a detective story about a mysterious fungus that lives on whiskey fumes. It won the... You gave away who did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it won the 2011 AAS Kavli Science Journalism Award for magazine writing and was the inspiration for his book, Proof, which we're talking about today, The Science of Booze, which won the 2015 IACP Prize and was shortlisted for the Penn E.O. Wilson Science Writing Award. Um, Rogers was also a writer and correspondent for Wired Science, a TV show produced by the magazine and PBS in 2007. He was also the host of The Storyboard, a Wired podcast, and before joining uh, Wired. Adam was a night science journalism fellow at MIT and a writer and reporter at Newsweek. Hello. <laughs> and J. Kenji Lopez Alt is the managing culinary director of Serious Eats, a columnist for Cooking Light and author of the James Beard award winning. I was there when it happened, so I can, <laughs> I can, I can say that this is true. Sure. New York Times bestseller, The Food Lab, Better Home Cooking Through Science, which was named the IACP Book of the Year for 2015. Yeah. You gotta you... trump the cookbook award, right? <laughs> <laughs> I get it, I didn't win a beard award, you guys. I got it, thank you, it's fine. <laughs> Jerks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is taking... Uh, this is taking... Uh, Longer than you expected, <laughs> yes. <laughs> An unexpected direction. Um, Kenji's a native of the Northeast U.S. He worked his way up through the ranks of some of Boston's finest restaurants. He studied science and engineering, uh, also at MIT, right? Also at MIT. Yeah. And is a former senior editor at Cook's Illustrated and America's Test Kitchen. Oh, and I also wanted to mention um, the influences. We, I kind of asked these guys who like, influenced them. So Kenji... No big surprise, Harold, Harold McGee and Shirley Corrier, two great uh, food science writers. Uh, also, Don Herbert, a.k.a. TV's Mr. Wizard. So keep that in mind. <laughs> and and uh, Richard Dean Anderson. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's one of mine. I want that, I want that one. <laughs> yeah, and as for Adam, uh, he cited the 1980s magazine Science. Also, Paul Harrington, who was a Wired columnist. And does he still write? Stuff for wired. He doesn't. He doesn't. He's. He's. I think he still bartends. Okay. Um, anyway, he wrote uh, a column, I guess, called Cocktail for the old Hot Wired site in the 1990s, and a book, Cocktail: A Drinks Bible for the 21st Century. So. So I wanted to give a little sort of behind-the-scenes story about how 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 I was asked to come and talk to these gentlemen on this panel. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but there is a food site called Food 52, which is awesome. Every year they do a cookbook bracket where they take a distinguished handful of all the cookbooks published in the previous year, and they ask distinguished writers, I suppose, to, um, to review them bracket style, and they'll sort of pit one book against another, in, and they won't be books that are necessarily uh, the same. <clears throat> so it's kind of challenging. And so um, Kenji's book was in, the, um, was in the piglet bracket last year. He won the first round. 
didn't survive the second round. Um, after the competition ended and a winner was named, uh, two food writers uh, in New York, Kat Kinsman and Helen Rosner, sort of had a conversation about the piglet. And a couple things jumped out at me. Um, they said, uh, th this is Helen Rosner, who's the editor of Eater, who's the long form features editor of Eater. She said, when I was reading um, Lauren Collins' Judgment, I had this epiphany that the tension between rigor and soul is the core of all arguments I've ever had about cookbooks. And the author who, um, the writer who um, caused Kenji to lose the second round sort of cited the prescriptivism of the book. And there's this, there's this conversation that ensued that sort of pitted, it's sort of the classic humanities versus science argument. And the question is, that I wanted to come with is, is science the enemy of soul in books about food and cooking? Um, so, so that's where I'd like to start. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so we're good here, everybody. <laughs> And I also wanted to say that these guys are, in a, in a way, in sort of hostile territory, because Berkeley, right, is... I live like here, of, wait a minute. Like one of the, like one of the great founding, founding places for like the humanities approach to cooking. The, 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 the sort of style of cooking, um, you know, sort of championed by Alice Waters and Chez Panisse, is all about storytelling, um, you know, about food in a very sort of English majory way. Um, <laughs> And so I wondered if, first of all, if you guys feel like you're in hostile territory. I mean, do you feel like... like now? Like, <laughs> I've come with an agenda. Um, if you guys feel like what you do is sort of, you know, hostile to the, to, the, to the traditional way that we think about sort of books about food and beverages, you know, which are based in... Um, you know, very familiar, comforting stories that involve history, that involve place, that involve travel. So, um, so Adam, do you want to do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly something that I had on my mind while I was writing, while I've been thinking about this, the subject matter for the years before I wrote the book. I, I um, you know, I wouldn't be interested in it if it didn't have um, theater. And if it didn't have place, if it didn't have an emotional connection for me, I think the, the first thing that I, if it's not the first thing, it's the second thing I talk about in the book is like my grandmother making martinis for my mom, right. you know, in front of me. And, and my grandmother, who was a professor at UC Berkeley, so hostile territory, really come at me. <laughs> is this how you people are going to play? Um, I get to play Freight and Salvage, and it's a hard room. Who'd have thunk? Uh, but, but I... But but for me, the, the the way that you, the way that you investigate and understand what you described as soul just now, the way that you, the way that, the, the the most important way to have an, an interaction with the, what Paracelsus called the book of nature, um, is to understand it, is to to investigate it, to ask questions about it, to unpack it, um, and I think, and just to go serious liberal arts for a second. You know, the, the, the kind of violence with which, like, Francis Bacon wanted to understand nature is not the only way to understand science and nature. You can have what Evelyn Fox Keller described as a feeling for the organism, that you can, you can interact with what you study in a, at a very emotional and soulful level, and that by understanding it, you deepen the, uh, you deepen the significance of that interaction. And that really is what I was coming from, is I wanted to know what was in those bottles behind the bar since I was a little kid. Why, why are they different colors? Why are they different shapes? And then when I was old enough to taste them, so six or seven, uh, why do they taste different? Why do they taste different? How do you make these? That's the way for me to engage at that level of soul. At least that's how, I, that's what I've, that's how I've always understood science, and it's certainly how I understood science that involves something as important as you say, as history and as the, the, the emotional connection that all of us have with food and drink. Yeah, I think you... Um yeah, there's a passage in your book where if you say, if you love something, my theory is you're supposed to ask what makes that thing tick. Um, you know, the way that you ask, the way that your book asks is a very different way than probably a lot of us are sort of familiar, which would be, you know, um, it would be a story sort of tinged with romance about, about you know, the tradition of whiskey making in, in like the Highlands or, um, you know, bourbon aging in Kentucky, um, 
And so, you know, you, you, you sort of address those things, but you, but you, I think, I think yesterday you said that you sort of, you know, approach the reporting the same way as if you were reporting on like a wastewater plant or something like that. <laughs> like <laughs> distilling. It's true. I mean, what I, the, the, the story that, the story that John's alluding to is what I, I had said that I, 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 as I was trying unsuccessfully to gain uh, backstage access to a, a giant brewery, um, an industrial scale, transnationally owned brewery here in California because I wanted to see the, you know, the pipes that are big enough to fit a Volkswagen Beetle and, and the machinery and the control panels for making all of these things work that produce, uh, amazingly enough, a, a product that tastes the same every time, year after year, oceans and oceans of this stuff that, that people all over the world drink, which is, you know, not easy. If you've ever tried to brew beer at home, I dare you, you know, to succeed at that level. And they really didn't want to let me in. And I think that the thing that, thing that probably um, clinched it for him was when I said, like, no, I mean, I think you, these places are impressive. These are amazing. I mean, they're like sewage treatment plants. They're like, you know, they're like, look. And I meant that as a compliment. I really did. You know, I mean, managing sewage for a city, like, that's not easy. And if you do it right, everybody has clean water. But they didn't. <clears throat> I don't think... Uh, that AB InBev saw it the same way. But, I, but I, I meant it with appreciation, as you say, and it was completely misunderstood. They heard it as like, you think that what we're doing is, well, I mean, just to, to be really reductionist about it, you think what we're doing is science and not art. And I was saying, no, I think that what you're doing is, is both of those things. Is that not, we just never, <clears throat> uh, it never worked. Yeah. Did, did, did they disagree? I mean, they they thought what they doing, were doing wasn't science? Or? Well, no, I think that the, um, the truth of it is I think that a very good brewer knows full well that, it's, that there's real science. Right. And I think that their marketing people know full well that they don't <laughs> want to admit it. Um, because, because, because what happens at the, when, when all of the very important things that you were describing, John, meet, meet commercialism, then, the, then um, the emotional connections and the history and the traditions um, become the, a, a marketing layer on top of right. a product. Mm -hmm. um, so the the so pla so a place like um, uh, like Wild Turkey or, or Jack Daniels, let's say these massive distilleries producing hundreds of thousands of gallons of, of bourbon whiskey every year, um, and, and producing something really excellent. I mean, you know, Wild Turkey 101 is to me one of the great American products. It's one of the great things that we make in the United States. But, it's, it, but make no mistake, it's an industrial process. It's, an industri it's industrialized chemistry at a massive scale. And, and that is not the way that Wild Turkey wants you to think about that bottle. They want you to think about it as old guys going up in the hills with a little still, which is not how you make Wild Turkey. And, and to me, that, that disconnect, the disconnect between that glass of brown liquid with ice that's so wonderful to drink and how it's made and how you're supposed to think about making it is a great storytelling tension. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly... Um it was, it was probably, you know, Michael Pollan in The Omnivore's Dilemma who kind of wrote brilliantly about the way that, you know, Whole Foods as an example sort of bends, bends story um, to, like, marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we kind of are sort of hungry to have a connection with, you know, we imagine these sort of local farmers, um, you know, never mind that, you know, industrial or organic is behind it, is behind most of it. So Kenji does... Um, does writing an eight-page recipe for meatloaf take the poetry out of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so, so, okay, so to me, you know, to me, it's not, there's not this sort of sliding, this, there's not this scale with science on one side and art on the other, and, which I think some people have that idea that, like, a recipe is this artistic, which means that it's less scientific, or it's this scientific, which means that it's less artistic. Um, to me, it's like two separate dials that you have, and, and, you, can, and you can treat them differently. And, and for me, you know, the, the, the interesting story in a recipe or in writing, um, it can be something that's, you know, purely personal, um, something about experiences I've had. Um, but to me, science is also an interesting story in, in, in and of itself. Um, and, and you can have both of those things in the same story. Um, um, you know, in this particular book, I tended to play down the personal and play up the science, um, ma mainly because, you know, I didn't want the book to be about me. You know, I wanted it to be about about helping other people understand how to cook. So, I, you know, I was writing it for someone like my little sister who 
is smart, is interested in cooking, but doesn't really know where to start and doesn't know much about it. Um, so it, so to, to then, you know, to, to bring too much personal stuff into it, I think, um, would, uh, I think it would limit the usefulness of the book because then it would be a book about me and not a book about cooking, which is really what it is. Um, which is not to say that I don't feel, feel like, you know, sometimes I have trouble expressing my emotions, my wife will say sometimes, but it doesn't mean that I don't feel them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I think, you know, other writing that I do, I think, has, has different degrees of, of personalness versus, um, versus impersonalness. But, but uh, to, you know, to say that, I don't think it means that there's no story in it as well, because, you know, I think, um, particularly, well, with, with my background and the, a lot of the types of friends I have, there, there are people who are sort of really, really deeply into the science, um, into the science story behind things and don't actually care much about, like, the... The, the the farmer who raised the, the the cow or whatever you know like I like I have a friend who um, who says you know eating eating a steak uh, like a lab grown steak 20 years from now if we can design a, a, a in a lab make a steak that has the perfect degree of marbling and the perfect whatever like to me that's actually pretty boring yeah. because um, <clears throat> because to me then the, sto the the meat doesn't actually really have a story you know it, it doesn't it, I I don't get to sort of make a connection with um, the, the formerly living thing in the land, or whatever it is that uh, that makes a steak interesting. Um, uh, but but to that friend of mine, you know, it, the science and the and the development that went into that science is the sort of interesting part of that story. Um, um, so I, to to say that like one type of story is, um, you know, to sort of place a value judgment on say one type of story is better than the other kind, or like one is more emotional than the other one, I think is sort of unfair. And maybe and maybe that's sort of what's at the heart of this debate is that for some people, I think that that kind of science based story doesn't really resonate on an emotional level um, and so they assume that for people who it does re that, that people who it does resonate to are like emotionless shells of people who only care about science but um, but I don't I, don't, I, I think that's an unfair assessment I, I, I mean I, I, I at risk of going full Vulcan here you know <laughs> I, I do think here's where I lose the room you ready uh, if you think that you, if you think that there is no emotional story behind some behind the science, then you don't know enough science. Right. Like you have right. not studied it enough. Like you, or nobody has taught it to you mm -hmm. in the right way, or nobody has told you those stories. Part of the mission, to the extent that my book has a mission, part of that mission was to say, look at the, look at the stories that gave us that that let us understand this science. That's how you tell science stories. That's how I was trained. That's part of, that's the state of the art in science writing. If you can pull that off, you've done a good job. So. So uh, you know that that idea that like that the story of the um, the story of the cow and the rancher and pr that produced the steak is somehow a more emotional story than the story of the researcher in the lab who figured out how to get stem cells on a polymer scaffolding to produce a steak that those two stories somehow are not equivalent sto are not are not compelling stories that one only one of them is compelling and in fact to ignore the vast amount of science that comes with the rancher and the steer is, is uh, that's to me misguided. And I mean, there, there is also, I think, two, two types of those science stories. So there's the story of the scientist and, and the development of that process, but there's also the story of like, you know, what goes on in that steak when you're cooking it, which isn't something that, you know, it's not something that is developed, it's not a technology that's developed, it's something that exists because of the laws of the universe. Um, but I think that's also interesting to see, you know, the laws of the universe are pretty interesting to me. Um, and the way we, then the more we discover about them, the more interesting they become. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think the fear of the, the, the you know, the lab-created steak is a story with built-in drama. Yeah. Um, but but the, the sort of drama, the magic of cooking um, is, is, you know, traditional cooking with, you know, the farmer and the cow in the field is that, um, you know, results are are like different because mm -hmm. you know the conditions you know the the cow itself the conditions under which it was raised the season it was raised is going to vary and so in a way uh, uh, you know food that has imperfection built into it is kind of beautiful um, just for that mm -hmm. and I think you know you know is it misguided fear that 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 sort of bold modern you know industrial science based food is going to be is going to have less personality, is going to yeah. be, um, you know, somehow um, inferior to something that we've known traditionally. Well, let, me, let me kind of build out a story um, in what you're talking about to, uh, that's related to lab-grown meat, which is lab-built lab wine. It's a, something that we've been looking at in, in my office. There's a company that says, 
by the way, never trust stories that come after the words, there's a company that says, <laughs> but there's a company that says that they can make synthetic wine. They, they sort of get a GCMS and they go, well, look, we can, we know how much ethanol's in it and we know how much water's in it and we know some of the phenols and the esters and the aldehydes and the, the organic chemicals and we sort of know what the fermentation process looks like and the aging process, we know what the, we know the wood contributes certain vanillins and, and tannins and so we're gonna take all those things from little vials and we're gonna mix them together and here's your you know, glass of wine, it's gonna taste like Cabernet. And, um, and they'll, you know, they wanna sell that. And so, uh, cause it'd be cheaper and faster and you could franchise it out like Coca-Cola and have local water, but syrups that they delivered. I, I don't know, I mean, you can imagine a business built out of that. Um, you guys are already buying two buck chuck anyway, it's basically <laughs> similar. Uh, and, and, but, but, but here's the, the best part of this story is that when you, when you taste it, as I understand it, we haven't got it in. I asked, I asked the writers to call it in. We gotta taste it. But apparently, when you taste it, it doesn't taste like wine. Which doesn't surprise you, right? You're all naughty. You're like, well, duh. <laughs> Why? Why doesn't it taste like wine? Well, the, the, the easiest answer is because nobody really knows what's in wine. And that is astonishing. Human beings have been making wine for 8,000 years. We don't know why it tastes the way it does. Why does wine taste the way it does? I have just incepted you into a science story. <laughs> Why does wine taste like that? Why does synthetic wine not taste like that? What are the differences? Why do people taste things that way? So that's, a, that, that's an emotional story to me. That's a, that's a story that all of us are, you know, you're all gonna go think about that when you have your glass of rosé <laughs> at lunch today. Like, wow, I don't know, this rosé is delicious and I don't know why. Um, and don't care after the second, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do you, I mean, do you think that's a sort of technological barrier though? Like, I mean, some, at some point we're going to know what makes ta wine taste like wine, I think. I that, I, I, that, that's a no, question I, that I think will be answered. Me too. No, I, I think so too, but I think that that will be fascinating. And then I think it will be, uh, then once you can synthetically, synthetic, it's all synthesis, but once you can in a lab make something that is indistinguishable from a 2012 Loire Valley. In a blind taste. In blind, yeah, in a blind triangle, like, you know, the, the, the three of us sitting up here, given a triangle test. Could not could, pick out the fake one. Couldn't pick the fake one. Once that happens, then, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a quantum leap. That's a new world that you live yeah. in when that happens. Because then you have to ask if there's a, if there's a, if there's a, um, a qualitative difference between the two liquids that is solely based on provenance. I, well, I think there is. I mean, the, the reality is that nobody tastes things blind, except unless you're unless you're doing tests like that. Um, but nobody tastes things blind, um, and you know, and that's that's what marketing is largely about. You you have you have to build in these stories to things uh, to things, um, and it makes things taste different. It's like the the. the you can you can drink like the world's crappiest beer, but if you drink it like at the end of a sixteen hour shift in a hot kitchen, it tastes way better than it does like first thing in the morning. Maybe first most of the <laughs> yeah. um, Well, that's like. <laughs> That's a whole um, and, different you know, and, and, and similarly, like, um, so um, uh, in, in my book at the beginning, there's a, there's a section where I'm talking about eggs, um, and people are convinced that eggs that come from their backyard taste better than the eggs that you buy from the supermarket. Um, in blind taste tests, most people cannot tell the difference. Um, but as soon as you tell someone that this egg came from a chicken that leads a happy life, it's eating bugs, it's doing stuff chickens are supposed to do, it makes the egg taste better. Um, and, you know, and, and to some people, I think that may seem like, oh, it's, it's a trick, you know, like it's, it's not really better, it's just a trick. But, but it's not really a trick because taste is not, is not just, um, uh, taste is not just something that you're perceiving on your tongue, not just something you're perceiving in your nose. It's, it's the way that those signals go into your brain and it's how your brain processes those things. So there's, there's stuff that's built into your brain that's going to affect the way that um, you interpret the signals that are coming in from your sensory apparatus. Um, and so, so in that sense, I think, um, you know, we're never going to be able to replicate a steak or replicate wine because it inherently has a different story and it has a different, um, it has a different meaning to us. Um, um, I, I just trailed off, but yeah. That's yeah, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it's a good trail. <laughs> I mean, the question for me is, is, or maybe the question for you is, is like, you know, what is wine? I mean, you know, looked at one way, wine is, you know, something that one could make synthetically. For me, you know, wine is the experience of like, you know, like driving to Kermit Lynch, you know, <laughs> um, sort of walking through the store, you know, talking to somebody who works there, feeling like I have this deep connection with the story of this wine, you know, that it reflects 
um, you know, certain, certain characteristics of winemaking that have happened in a region in France for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I can't taste that. I mean, I'm sure that I can't taste that. I'm sure in a blind tasting I'd be humiliated. Um, but, it's, but, I, but, but that story is a big part of what makes wine for me, well, let me what defines I, wine for me. Let me argue by analogy a little bit, because I, I, I do think that's important, but I think, you're on, I think when you're talking about those distinctions, you're on um, intersecting axes. They're related or overlapping magisteria, let's say. So around the corner, there's a comic book store. Fantastic comics. It's my local. <laughs> um, I've been reading comics since I was six years old, so 40 years of comics. And the um, this and I read like I'm, I, I read you know the, the indie stuff and the good stuff, but I also read like cheese ball superhero, garishly clad men and women punching evil people with purple faces kind of comic books, and I have my whole life. And those stories are meaningful to me. With great power comes great responsibility, and rocketed to earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men are like foundational tales for me. Okay, um, and so that that's that those things are meaningful to me. Um, I've also, as a reporter, I've covered a lot of nerd stuff. I've interviewed a lot of the people who make the movies and write the comic books. And I know about the backstories of how, you know, maybe Stan and Stan kind of stole some of the stories from Jack and that kind of stuff. I know those stories. I actually, I know a little bit about how the new computer controlled color process works, how there aren't really hand colors anymore, that they use computers and there's, there are no more letterers, hand letterers. It's mostly done by computer too. Those are all stories about comic books. They all mean something to me. Um, and they're all true, but they're different ways of looking at the at the issue. Uh, and I think that's an I think that's okay. Those are different kinds of slices of the of the pie. To go use a food metaphor about a comic book metaphor I was using to talk about food. Um, I think that's all right. Uh, and I don't I wouldn't privilege any one of those stories over the other. They're all different stories that I can tell myself about whether Spider Man will beat the Green Goblin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh no! Um, I, w I was going to say um, r related to what uh, back back to lab steaks and, and wine. Um, so I, I think I, I think some people have this sort of mis misconception that that science has an agenda. That like the end goal of science is the lab grown steak or the <laughs> lab or the lab made wine. Um, and and to me like so that that's one that's one of these that's when I know that someone I think doesn't understand what science is. Um, you know so. What, what I, what I, the way I try to explain it is that, like, if you know, if, if science is not, so science is really just sort of like um, a map, like an atlas. So, like, if I'm, if I'm working on, a, if I'm writing a recipe, um, and most, most recipes, what they are is a series of step-by-step -step instructions that start at one point and lead you to another point, and that's, you know, that's just like turn-by-turn -turn directions. You're, you put it into your your um, your phone and it tells you how to get there and you get there um, and to me that's 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 the prescriptivist approach like having a re having a written recipe and just following it that's that's prescriptivist to me um, what science does is it is it allows you to zoom out and see you know why am I taking these turns like maybe I can take an alternate route to get there or you know say my starting ingredients are slightly different how am I going to take them how, like what turns should I take to get them to the same endpoint or how do I get to a different endpoint um, and it's not like having this map is forcing you to go one way or another it's actually quite the opposite it lets you. It gives you the. the it empowers you as the user, um, as the map reader, to decide where you want to go. Um, and so, and so that's what science is like. The more the more knowledge you have, the more details you're filling in on that map, and the more choices you have about where you where you start and where you want to end up. Um, so, you know, when when somebody says, "Oh, I don't like the prescriptivist approach to this science book or whatever," um, I, I think that's sort of a fundamental misunderstanding of what science is. And and maybe that's you know. My fault or whoever, whatever science writer's fault for not explaining it properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might even go just to like really climb on a really high horse. <laughs> the, the I find it a little bit, um, I find it a little bit insulting the notion of like that someone could read your work and suggest that you don't love cooking enough, which is really <laughs> what the that's really what the argument is saying. Like, no, 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 he, he's not feeling it. It's like, well, <laughs> I've you know I've read your stuff and that's dumb. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dumb argument. That's not, a, that's not cool. It, and similarly, I think it's sort of insulting to say that, you know, your nana in the kitchen who alters her famous bread recipe, depending on whether it's humid out or not, is not using science. She was. She is. You know, even if she doesn't, even if she doesn't define it the same way that a, that a food chemist at, down at UC Davis would, that's what's going on in there. It's disingenuous to say that when you're cooking, you're not using science. You might not notice or admit or recognize, but like it doesn't work unless you do. <laughs> it's like it's, when you get the new toaster, um, 
you have to dial in the, di the number, right? And it's like, if you can cook it at six and you're like, that's too brown. Then you cook it at three and that's too light. And then finally you get it, you're like, okay, this new toaster, I want 4.5 toast. And that's, that's science. You right? have that's done science now. <laughs> yes. yes, that's all it is. That's right. But, but there, um, yeah, there was a conversation, uh, I think at the um, San Francisco Cooking School recently with Harold McGee and um, Daniel Patterson, the chef. And kind of what I came away from that, you know, I sort of read, read about it, and, um, but was that, was that um, sort of getting a firm grasp on what's happening while you're cooking can be a way to allow you to cook more intuitively because once you understand what's going on, then you can um, sort of take off on your own. You don't have to follow, you know, eight pages of steps. You can you can you can sort of freestyle, you know, once you know once you know the principles of what's going on. But the other thing I wanted to say to, to or ask you guys is that what your books are are these sort of beautiful. Um, in a way, arguments for sort of science and a technical approach. But I think what's made them popular is that they is, are things that don't really have much to do with science. I mean, Kenji, you have this very charming, engaging, kind of nerdy personality that comes through really strongly. <laughs> and so... I mean, I, I, I tell a lot of dad jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like dad jokes, sort of, you know, kind of wincing, you know, sort of puns that make you wince. Um, but, it, but, it's, but, it's, uh, but, it, but, it, but it feels really fresh and charming. And I would, I would bet that, you know, your, you know, fandom has as much to do with that as with the the you know the actual you know sort of you know prescriptive parts of the recipes um, and you know Adam with you it's just it's excellent journalism I mean you you have this you know very um, uh, um, engaging voice um, and it's 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 beautifully reported um, thank you so you know we're you know it's kind of like the packaging that you guys are sort of presenting your message in is itself very engaging. So, you know, what, you know, do you, were you aware of that when you were sort of, sort of writing? I mean, were you aware that that would sort of, you know, maybe sort of ease people's fears about science? Um, um, so for, yeah, for me, I mean, so there's two things that I was very aware of. Um, so one of them was trying to make it light and, and reasonably funny. Um, and I think that, you know, as far as when I'm, when I'm writing something, whether it's a story online or, or the book, like making it funny and fun to read is, is by far the hardest part. Like that's the stuff I work hardest on, like trying to think of more clever analogies or whatever, some funnier references or something that's going to get people to connect. Um, that, you know, that, that was one element that I was really aware of. And the other element that I was strongly aware of is that, you know, if I'm going to make this... Um, these lessons about science engaging, um, then, you know, so the recipe selection was one of the big things for me. Um, you know, I don't, I don't cook most of the stuff in the book. Like, I don't eat macaroni and cheese or meatloaf, honestly. Like, the last time I made meatloaf was when I made, like, 50 of them <laughs> doing the research in the book. Um, so I, I don't really eat the way the book does, but a lot of people do, right? Um, and so, so for me, like, the, you know, to, to come at it from the science angle and to also, like, say, like, by the way, like, this is my recipe for Mapo tofu, which maybe people in this room love, but most of, pe most of the people in America don't really know what it is. It's like, there's too many unfamiliar things and there's not really anything that people can latch onto. So I made like a very conscious decision. Okay, like this is gonna be a book about meatloaf and mashed potatoes, like something that is gonna give people like, um, you know, maybe I'm not interested in science, but I'm really interested in meatloaf. Um, and then they kind of learn the, <laughs> the science and the process. So, you know, sort of the, the meatloaf is like the, um, I, I always think, yeah, the meatloaf is like the cheese sauce and the science is like the broccoli that you're, <laughs> hiding in there, um, but but you have but but yeah, that, and and humor. It's all it's all about It's all just about engaging the audience and making sure that um, there's something interesting to read there, and so that by the time they're done reading something that is fun to read, then they accidentally learn things while they're doing it too. Right. I I was uh, very conscious of having two two audiences, both of whom I was playing a little bit of a of a trick on. Um, I, so I, when I, even when I was pitching the book, I said, look, this is going to be a, a science book um, that will be about booze, and it's going to be a booze book that will have some science in it. Um, with the whole time, my uh, kind of double secret probation plan being like, well, I'm going to do some rock solid, 
I'm going to try to do some rock solid science journalism and do the journalism to explain some really, really hard science, drawing my examples from things that people can find behind a bar. So the, the book has my, 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 some of my favorite parts of the book are like metallurgy. And uh, there's some, there's a, there's a lot of hard neuroscience in there. There's, um, there's some, some pretty good, uh, some pretty good biochemistry. Um, there's a lot of fun history. I didn't know I was going to do that much history, but I got into it. And and all of it gets kind of your your analogy was was cheese sauce and broccoli. And I guess I would say like you know it, that it's all it's all mixed in, but the but the main uh, the base spirit is just rye. Like there's just it's all in a cocktail, and you sort of don't notice the vegetables. I guess um, that was really important to me that I I wanted to be able to tell I wanted to be able to do this hard science to explain it in a way that people would understand, and and in fact in a way that they didn't even they didn't even feel the needle go in. Is anyone making broccoli cocktails? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I don't know about broccoli, kale but... Kale cocktails there must be. Kale, <laughs> like celery root, like, you know. Yeah. I haven't tried that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, is... Do you think that, um, you know, part of the problem and something that you guys had to battle against was just that we have, like, really, like, crappy science education... Um, you know, in America. And so there is this feeling like, you know, science is um, kind of soulless, um, you know, not appealing, um, scary. Um, what, what do you think? Um, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it's bad science education. I think one of the problems is, is scientists. I think there's like scientific snobbery that, um, that only real scientists can do science. Um, and, and, uh, and, and you see this sometimes in like, well, well in st stories about, you know, I'm sure this comes up in Wired also where people write about science and then somewhere in the comments like a real scientist comes in and says, oh, this isn't science, like this is bullshit. And it's like, it's like you're, not, you're not helping your cause by trying to turn other people <laughs> off to what you're doing, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know, I, th I, think, I think a lot of the problem is that like there is this sort of scientific snobbery. Um, but but, but I, I, honestly, I think uh, at least in popular media, I think it's getting better than it used to be, you know, like, like that a show like like Mythbusters can be um, so popular or that, you know, that or like Alton Brown had a show for years. Um, so I think, you know, pop, popular science, I think, is doing pretty well. And, and a lot of that has to do with the Internet and making it easier for people to find good science writing and, and science shows and things like that. Um, and like blowing stuff up. I mean, and blowing. Yeah. Blowing stuff up makes it cool. Why you watch Myth, yeah. Mythbusters. Have you seen the hydraulic press channel on YouTube? It's no, just no, pushing no, stuff no. under a hydraulic <laughs> press. It's no. pretty cool. <laughs> Science. <laughs> All right, maybe my snobbery is showing a little bit too. I, you know, here's so here's a here's a, a a super writerly way to think about this if you want. Um, most scientific journal articles uh, are uh, the 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 voice is passive. They are just to double up on this joke. They are written in the passive voice. Um, which is to say that, like, you don't know who an actor is in it. You know, the 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 um, the the centrifuge was run at the cells were extracted from. Um, so that's a it, from a, a pure writing perspective. That's how science expresses itself to itself. Which is to say, it, in, in its most official form, it removes the human actor because it's trying to express as an institution. It's trying to express a fundamental rule of the universe trying to say, well, we didn't, I mean, a human didn't, didn't have a finger on the scale here. This is a thing that happened because we are telling you the truth about how things happen. And that's important. That's good. Um, I spend a significant portion of my day uh, humiliating writers and extracting passive voice from their writing. <laughs> Don't do that. The, 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 the car was not moved. Someone moved the car. Tell me who. That's part of your job. And it's part of your job to use a more active verb because people like reading active verbs. It makes your writing feel better. So, so please fix this passive voice that you put. So, write, so that, that's, not just a, um, that's not just a different folk way. That's a different way of, of seeing the universe and expressing it. And, and I think taking science, part of my job is taking science and putting it in the active voice um, because that makes people who aren't scientists able to understand it and want to read it. I, I would say that there is a, that one of the faults to the extent that science as an institution has a fault here in connecting with a non-scientific and a non-science speaking world, as Kenji was talking about, is like, folks, let's try some active voice. 
<laughs> you know, let's, let's acknowledge that there are human beings trying to understand a, 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 an amazing, a remarkable universe. Um, that's, that's what the process is. And when we express it to people, when, we, when, when that somehow gets, manages to get across to a kid, they become a scientist when they realize that. We don't always express it that well. I was trying to do that in the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I, I mean, I, I feel the same way that I think, you know, my, my job and I think the thing, the thing that I'm good at, um, you know, is not like I'm not a scientist. I'm not really a cook anymore. Um, but my, but I do, you know, I, I consider myself a science writer and my job is to take rather relatively complicated and sort of sometimes boring, at least boringly um, presented um, scientific facts and then try and turn them into something that's useful to people and also interesting to people. And I think, you know, that, that's, that's what, I, what I spend most of my day doing. Right. And I, I think what, um, you know, for, for me, one of the takeaways from both of your books was this, um, and the thing that made me less scared about thinking about science, I suppose. Yay! Is feeling that they, that, that they exist in some way to, um, sort of bring or explain or deliver sort of pleasure and delight, which is something that I understand very well. Um, and, and, um, and in a way, you know, th there's so much bad sort of traditional storytelling. You know, there's, there's so many unsatisfying stories of, you know, where the, where the cow was raised. Um, so many stories now um, that I probably don't trust that it's kind of refreshing to think of, um, you know, to sort of look and see how, um, you know, bourbon is actually sort of distilled and aged that's kind of comforting in a way. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's like, you know, the question is, can it still, you know, can it still bring the same delight, you know, when I'm sitting in, in uh, when I'm sitting in a bar? Um, that's still, that's... But, but, but let me, well, th two things. I would say I have a, a little bit of, a, of an advantage writing about booze rather than food in the sense that bars and the consumption of alcohol really do reward a certain know-it-allism. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that, there, that, that maybe it's a, that it's a smaller proportion of the, of the food-consuming community. Um, you know, pushing up your glasses and saying actually in a bar is kind of tradition. That's it's the same thing as buying a round. That's, you know, it's like, actually. Um, and I do take a certain delight in that know-it-allism, I will acknowledge. <laughs> um, but I would, you know, I, I might also like kind of try to poke a finger through some of the the self-inflated food and food and, and food slash travel writing, where the only way to extract a narrative from it is that the experience of it changes the writer's understanding of the world in some way, yeah, which I find to be its own sort of know-it-allism and, and self-importance. The idea that like, now that I've met the cow, I really understand how my food works. Like, I don't care if you understand your food. That's not my, you know, no matter how beautifully you've written it, what you've done is using elegant words. You've lured me into the memoir. And I didn't, I didn't you know, I didn't buy that ticket. Um, <laughs> and that's, so that's my problem. That's me. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of people read memoir and love that. And a lot of people read travel and like the delight and the beautiful descriptions of the places. But I, I for me, as a personal matter, I, 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 want, I want more. I want to know, well, why does it look like that? Tell me that story. And so, since nobody had with booze, once I noticed that, I realized I had a book to write. It was great. Yeah. And, and it's important to I mean, note that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Totally. Right? You can yeah, have yeah. a good travel story that is also, also gives you the why. And I'm intentionally being a jerk about it here, too. Like, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I see that. Like, I'm, 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 try, I'm, I'm pushing on that to make a point, but just to say, like, there is a different kind of story that has more of an appeal for, for me. And, and, mm -hmm. but, but, it is, but, but yes, also, you know, I, you tell them and I tell them. There's, there's travel stories, there's memoir, there's there, there, the way that you tell the story is, it ultimately is gonna be personalized. Yeah. All right, I think it might be time to field some questions. Um, so I think there were, yes, I see the microphones being, being collected. Um, all right. What do we do? Do people just scream if you want a microphone? <laughs> Do you, are you, are you going to pick it? You know, let them do it? How would we? Let's see. Hi, so um, thank you both for your, um, 
talks and all that, it's very interesting. So I'm a, a researcher in complex systems and a question that I struggle with a lot is, do you think that kind of scientific reductionism, so picking things apart and testing variables and all that um, at like a very basic level can give us an understanding of the world where we could say that we would totally like understand or grok it, like in, in the words of Heinlein? Um. Will scientific reductionism can can you are you asking can that eventually lead to a perfect understanding of the world? Oh um, no, I mean I don't. I, well, I think that's one of the basic one of the basic principles of good science is that you should never be happy with where we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scientists are never happy. Have you met these people? <laughs> Come on. I mean, there's all there's always more to learn. Um, but but you know, it, it, I think I mean reductionism. I, th I think it depends on the context. Um, you know, w with with food, there there is the danger that it, that if you just reduce it down to its variables, you end up with this sort of sterile story, and that and that your food ends up not being interesting. Um, and I and, I and I think to some degree, like you know, some of the sort of pseudo scientific like molecular gastronomy type stuff that was going on five to fifteen years ago um, is an example of that where the where the food just became about the story of how we did this as opposed to having other elements um, and, and as opposed to thinking about how um, people are going to experience and 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 the, and the sort of the whole perception of taste and whatever in your brain um, so but but I, but I don't think I think most people don't think about it that way you know like um yeah, I, I certainly don't think about it that way. Like, I, I, th I you know, when, when I'm, at least when I'm researching recipes, um, the first thing I do is always ask myself what the recipe means to me, like what this particular dish means to me, um, and then also what it means to other people and the history of the dish, because the last thing you want to do is end up with um, a meatloaf that is, like, technically perfect, but, no, but when people try it, they're like, that's not quite meatloaf, you know, and, and maybe that's maybe that's the, the wine element. Like you, you don't want to you don't want to end up somewhere where it become where there's no emotional attachment at all, and where there's no story because then that's pretty that's a boring food to me. It's not um, it, it does it, it it's missing a certain element that um, um, that makes it what it is. Um, so I guess that's the danger of reductionism in at least in food science. But um, but on, on the other hand, you know, understanding things on a very minute level, um, it's it's sort of like. Uh, if you're a musician, right, like learning, practicing your scales or like learning, um, learning some basic theory um, um, is not going to make you a worse musician just because you're only focusing on the scales. Um, it, it's just something, like, it's like a tool um, that, that adds to your background understanding of what you're doing um, and, and, and how you're interpreting it and, and how you're producing your music. Um, so um, it, it's like, but, you know, like what John said before that, you know, the, the more understanding you have, I think the more you're sort of able to riff on it and, and, and be a little bit freer in the kitchen. I, I, I don't know if that any of my answer is related to your question. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, because you work in complex systems, the, that, the, the old distinction, uh, lumpers versus splitters, um, that you can break almost any group, but science in particular, into the people whose work is about synthesis and finding connections, and the people whose work is about doing finer and finer grain splitting apart. These are both noble pursuits. Um, I think probably uh, as a journalist, I tend to be a lumper. I'm trying to find patterns and through lines, and sometimes that through line is story, and sometimes that through line is a is a scientific pattern. But I, I think that that um, I think that that goes for writing, and it goes for food, especially that they, these are um, again overlapping magisteria. They are different ways of understanding the same thing. It, it is it is totally okay to understand. Um, you know the 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 recipe for chicken soup that got handed down in your family in, in matzo balls for you know five generations to understand it as the way to connect with your great great grandmother as well as a way to understand how starches unfold in heat. Yeah, and um, I you know my understanding of like Harold McGee is is that he's he's you know able to sort of synthesize this sort of literature. Um, you know the sort of poetry of food with 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 actual science. Um, he, the, the, the McKee book is a is a great example of this because I think that one of the key things to to notice about about on food and cooking is what's not in it, which is recipes. Right? right? There's no recipes in McGee's book. There's there, and, and that is why there are no cocktail recipes in mine. <laughs> because I'm like I'm not about that. I'm not trying to teach people how to make drinks. I'm trying to teach people why to make drinks. And I, I, I think Harold would 
kind of say that too. Like he's trying to get at the, the underpinnings, the infrastructure, the, the world behind the world. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that that's just, um, I don't think that's just breaking things down into smaller and smaller parts until they're irreducible. I think that's a different kind of synthesis. For me, that was, I, I, I don't know. Like Kenji, is that your experience of, of, of McGee's work too? Like is, um, that, yeah, that, no, it is. Um, I, you know, I think, I think one, um, and, I, and I don't, I'm not saying that this is a fault in McGee's book because it's, my most used book, but um, I think you know. I think one of, one of the elements that I think some people have um, connecting with McGee's book is that it, it's not immediately obvious unless you've been cooking for a while how to apply what's in it to, like, like how to how to make it applicable and how to how to apply it to your cooking. Um, and so it, you know, it's useful for a certain type of person who's been cooking a lot. Very useful for chefs. Interesting if you're just a, a fan of science writing. Um, um, but, but the fact that it doesn't have recipes, I think, is something that makes it difficult for some people to access because they're like, okay, well, this is what happens when a steak cooks, but then how do I use that to cook a better steak? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's true. Ready for another question? <laughs> yes, okay. we're ready. Oh, how about up here? Oh. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm curious why you think that there are such con there's such contradictory advice about cooking very basic things. For instance, beans. Do you dump the soaking, from a science perspective, do you dump the soaking liquid, don't, and these are from our authoritative cooks, seemingly. Do you dump the soaking liquid or not? Do you add salt before it's almost done or not? So that's, why is that the case, that there seems to be real contradictions? And then, what are your, some of your favorite examples? Well, so I, I, I think it's, it's similar to the re So I, I drive my wife to the bus stop every morning where she gets on the bus. Um, it's about a 10-minute drive from our place, and there's two routes you can take. Um, we can either go down um, Camino Real or we can go down 25th Avenue. And um, I'm convinced that going down Camino Real is the faster way to do it on average, and she's convinced that 25th Avenue is the faster <laughs> way to do it on average. And every morning we get into this little fight when we're at the, t at the point where you make that turn, like, do we do it this way or do we that, do we that way? Usually we do it my way because I'm the one driving. Um, but I don't, I don't have any backup for why I think my way is faster. Like, I haven't sat there and timed both methods and, and actually seen which one is on average faster. Um, I'm just convinced it is. And I, and I know that if I go this way, I'm probably going to get there on time. Um, and so, so I think that a lot, of it is, a lot of it is that. You know, it's that the way cooking is passed down, it's like if something works... Um, then, then it works, and there's no reason, for a lot of people, there's no reason to question that. It's like, I know, like, throwing out my bean liquid um, and replacing it uh, is make, makes me a pot of beans that tastes good. I don't know if it tastes better than if I saved the bean liquid, but I've never tried it, and I know that this way works, so why does it matter? Um, and, and I think that's actually a perfectly fine way to cook. You know, I think, I think it's perfectly fine if, if, if you're happy with the results of your dish and you've been doing it the same way forever and you've never tried it another way, um, I, think, I think that's fine. Um, it's not the way I like to do things. Um, but 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 as I just proved myself, like it, it's I, it is the way I do things in other parts of my life. Um, <laughs> um, some I guess some good examples are well beans. Um, I've I've had many chefs who told me like oh don't don't salt the bean water because the beans will never soften. Um, turns out it's not true, and it's actually quite the opposite. The, the skins soften better if you if you salt the water and if you soak them in salted water at night um, overnight when you're salting them. Um, uh, the, the enemy of beans is actually acid um, because it inhibits pectin breakdown in the in the skins. Um, I mean, that's one. There, I mean, there's, there's. I think I think generally, like the more sort of uh, like manly a food is, the more deep or the more Italian, the more sort of deeply held <laughs> myths there are about it. Um, so you know, like there's tons of myths about cooking steak, like like flipping them only once, or um, um, there's myths about cooking pasta and like the amount of water you have to use and thing, all, things like that. Um, um, it, it, Italian food, it's really crazy. Like any, anytime you write anything about Italian food, like it's guaranteed that in the comments there's going to be, oh, like my nonna made it this way. And, <laughs> um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's funny because everybody's grandmother made it differently. So, you <laughs> so I've taken to writing sometimes in these Italian food recipes, like this is like not your specific grandmother's red sauce. <laughs> and that's fine. That's why um, there were all the city-state wars in Italy for all those centuries. Yeah, there you go. All the grandmothers, the red sauce recipes. <laughs> um, I actually uh, have, um, because of Kenji's book, started putting salt in the eggs that I've beaten and letting them rest before uh, putting them onto the heat, uh, which I, I had stopped putting salt in. I was like, don't put the salt in the eggs. You can't put salt in eggs when you scramble. I scramble. I make a lot of eggs. I have two. I have a ten-year-old and a six-year-old that we ate a lot of eggs, and and now that's now that's changed thanks to Kenji. Now there's salt in him again, which is <laughs> it's like a revelation in my house. Um, 
you know, most of the advice or instructions, rules, whatever, for making um, cocktails, especially if you look online, uh, is actually aimed at bartenders. And bartenders are, have a different goal than you do at home because they're trying to work fast and at scale. So, for example, for a while I was buying jiggers to use in my house because they're beautiful and I was buying nicer and nicer ones. And then I realized, you know what, I don't, I don't really use these very well. <laughs> I, I spill and they, I don't, I'm not trying to make nine mojitos fast and on a Friday night. You have a bar night. back to clean up for you. And I don't have a bar back and I don't have somebody cutting all the, I'm like, no, I'm using a measuring cup from now on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. This is ridiculous. It's a, like all the jiggers are gone from my, from my bar over in the corner. That's, you know, so there's a, there's a difference in goals and. I think Kenji's example about using having going in different directions. Like this is why I use ways. I go a different way every time. I let the computer <laughs> tell me now, and it knows. It predicts the future. It can tell me whether there's traffic. <laughs> and I love that. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there's different. Um, you're trying to get to a different place sometimes. I, th I think that that point about the difference between like cooking professionally and cooking at home is is actually one that comes up a lot in in recipes and why like chefs generally write the worst recipes for home cooks because they mm -hmm. just come from a completely different background um, with different with a different set of starting goals and parameters, um, different type of equipment. Um, so like for for instance, I think I think that's actually where the whole like only flip your steak once thing came from. It's like if you're if you're working in a steakhouse and you have you're cooking 40 steaks at a time. You don't you don't want to sit there flipping them over and over and over. So you put them out, you put them down once. You know you know that when you flipped it once, that this one's okay about halfway done, and it's much easier to keep track of everything that way. But at home, you're cooking maybe four, six steaks at a time at most. Um, um, plus, you're only doing it maybe a couple times a year, so you don't have that sort of like natural sense by t like sense of just looking at it and touching yeah. it, the sense of feel that you develop by doing it every night um, um, forever. Um, so you have. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a different it's a different style of cooking, and, and you have a different set of end goals. Um, which is, you know, I, I think you can actually produce a better steak at home than you can get in a steakhouse because you can focus on those four steaks um, and make sure that you're you know you're flipping them repeatedly. You're building up a nice brown crust on the outside. You're doing it in a way that um, that that with a type of attention and a type of attention to detail and with a certain type of knowledge that the the restaurant cook actually can't um, give that steak. At home, you can stir your drink and ice with your finger. <laughs> Nobody says nothing. It's my drink. <laughs> I, I just pour the two spirits in. You just keep just swish, swish, them, swish them around in my mouth. Totally, yeah. totally Suck kosher. Suck on an ice cube after. That's a, that's a fine tradition. All right, well, um, I, like a previous questioner, I'm also a scientist, and I'm actually getting my PhD in heat transfer. So I had a mini science gasm mm -hmm. when you started talking about like, convection and conduction in your book, <laughs> Kenji. That was exciting. Um, don't tell me everything I got wrong. But. <laughs> <laughs> that was, it was good. You did a good job explaining it to the public. And then I want to um, talk about copper and stills after you've done this. Oh, question. it'll be great. We can have a little chat. Um, but my question might actually take you maybe a little bit out of your comfort zone, but um, I've been celiac for well over a decade. And one of the interesting things that I've always searched for in books is the science behind, you know, when you replace a flower with, you know, a dozen alternative flowers. You know, what's actually happening? It could be the heat transfer. You know, it could be the chemistry of what's going on. And I'm curious if, you know, either of you or if you know anyone that's actually really trying to look in the same sort of, you know, constructive way that you break down the science into that, you know, gluten-free or even just allergen-free mm -hmm. um, baking or cooking. That is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I actually honestly don't, don't have an answer to that question. Um, I, I mean, I know there are other people sort of like me who are, um, who are pop science writers um, and not actual lab scientists who, are try, who, who theorize about things like that and write about it. Um, I'm sure that, I mean, I'm sure that there are lab scientists hired by, by big flower companies who are trying to develop better, um, <laughs> better uh, gluten-free um, flower replacements who do this actual real work, who do, who do the real science, um, but I'm not a real scientist. <laughs> it does, it, ha it comes up increasingly in, um, in the spirits and beer and wine world too, of course, because in beer it's an issue and in, and, and, and some of the distilled spirits folks are, are making it an issue by pointing out that their vodka is gluten-free when in fact it <laughs> has been for 2,000 years. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I had a conversation with um, uh, the, the guy who's basically the, the best beer scientist in the world, and he was talking about a gluten-free beer that they were working on. But he said, you know, um, we were looking at some just regular beer, and I'm not really sure there's gluten in that either. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's still, th these, are, these are open questions in science, which I would say like if you're a science journalist is actually pretty exciting, because that means there's stories to tell. It's not so useful for someone who's celiac, I'm afraid. 
Uh, any other questions? Hi, yeah, I, uh, I actually am an editor, not a scientist, and so I was Finally. curious, <laughs> Kenji, when you said that you don't think of the science and the story as being separate, and you think of them as two separate dials that you adjust, but in the reality of writing, there are word limits, and there are mm -hmm. things that you're supposed to target, and so does the science ever get diluted or cut in the way that you, you, both of you write about things in order to preserve more story, or how does that balance actually translate when you have to have a 500 word story? Yeah, well, so, okay, so there's, <laughs> there's, a, couple, there's a couple answers to that question. Uh, the first is that I, I did my writing, on, most of my writing online where there's less of this sort of real estate limit. Um, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, I mean, look how thick my book is, so my editor didn't really, really <laughs> cut, cut that much. So, I, um, no, but, but I mean, I think the real answer is, for, for me, um, in order for a story to be successful, and, and in order for me to sort of like brand it as like a food lab story, because I write some stories that aren't real food lab stories, um, but in order for me to call it like a food lab story, you can't, you, you have to answer the why. And, and that can be as little as like one sentence that explains basically, or, or it can dive much deeper into it, but whatever it is, like I don't want people coming away thinking like, well, he didn't explain that, you know, he, he said do this, but he didn't tell me why I'm doing that. Because um, to me, that, for me, that's like the most frustrating part about growing up and learning things. Like when, when someone just told me, just do it, like that, do it because I say, like that, um, I, like I just don't like authority in that sense. Um, like I, I, I want to let the universe tell me what to do as opposed to um, a teacher or a professor. Um, so so that, that's, that's the basic criteria for me. Like um, it, there has to be, there has to be that, that why and the why has to make sense. Um, and then from there, I can decide, you know, whether it's going to be all about the why, which sometimes it is. Um, and those stories are actually usually more difficult to write because you have to make it all about the why, but also exciting and interesting. Um, um, or whether it's just going to be an aside that explains the why. I'm a, I'm, I, I have always been, I trained most of my career in print, and I have always been pretty intense structuralist as, as an approach. So like, no, here's how you're going to put this together. Here's how I'm going to put this together so that it will have the elements that I need and, and also have some, um, some entertainment, some compelling reason for the reader to, to begin and then to keep reading. Um, having spent the last couple of years more focused online, where it is true that the, the lack of a word count, the, the internet turns out to be an insatiable maw. You can't you know, you can always write more, um, and sometimes that really jeopardizes a single piece of writing. Cause mm -hmm. There's that moment of sort of in the third quarter of the piece where the writer will go, and here are other things I also know. I <laughs> <laughs> might want to cut that section. Um, but like, uh, but what you do end up looking for online, I think, is a certain kind of propulsive musicality, um, maybe a little bit different than we used to do in in print, that um, that does have a different rhythm, but still a rhythm of, of moving back and forth, ideally in a way that the seams are invisible between narrative and exposition and um, in, in some cases some really hard science that transcends just exposition and becomes like, we're gonna do a little spade work here, folks. Um, so, but, but, but that as an editor, I think you would probably say the same as I would, which is that challenge is part of the fun. You know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. <laughs> I'd also want to add that you know on, on the other on the other side of that equation, um, a story. Um, the the other main criteria I have for a story, other than, other than explaining the why, is that a story has to be a story, um, in that it that it has to have a beginning, middle, and end. It has to have some kind of climax and resolution and, and conflict, um, and it has to be something that is interesting. So whether whether the story is about baking chocolate chip cookies or about taking a trip to Mexico or whatever, like there has to be a story element to it that that has a has a real arc. Yeah, plus one. So I am a recent Berkeley transplant, so if this is a bad thing to say as someone in Berkeley, I'm going to apologize in advance, but I really loved Kenji's recent defense of American cheese. Um, and I thought it was an interesting sort of note in the bigger food conversation of everything needs to be perfect and fresh and organic and GMO-free and all of these things. And I'd love to hear sort of from both of you your thoughts on the purest notion of food and how that does it. American cheese tastes good on a burger. <laughs> like just accepting that fact sometimes. So. Well, so yeah, okay. So I mean, it, it's to say it tastes good, it tastes bad is not really that interesting to me because 
you know, that, that's just down to a matter of taste, and there's uh, lots of elements that come into play there. Um, but I, th I think a lot of people who, um, who say, oh, but American cheese is processed, like, all cheese is processed. <laughs> like, that's, that's a fact of cheese. You process milk and turn it into cheese. Um, we, we actually understand that process quite well now. We, I mean, we don't understand exactly what makes a specific cheese in the same sense that we don't understand all the products of fermentation in wine. Um, but, um, but we have a pretty good understanding of why cheese gets the texture it does. Um, and, and because we have that understanding, we can then add to that process and, and make a different style of cheese. Um, and so, so it, you know, I think, I think one of the problems is that some people have this idea that, like, um, that food is, is perfect now, right? Like, it, like the, that cheese, cheese is done. Like, we've reached the end point of cheese. Um, Peak cheese. <laughs> um, and, or, or the same thing, like, people who are like, oh, like, this recipe is not authentic because it's not how it was done 100 years ago. Well, you know what? Like, it's, what they were doing 100 years ago wasn't what they were doing 400 years ago. Maybe with some cheeses it's true, but... Um, um, I don't want to harp on the Italians, but um, <laughs> but they didn't have tomatoes in Italy 500 years ago, and people and people complain about altering. It's like you, you know, recipes change, people's cooking techniques change, processes change, um, and so and so to say that like something is not good, inherently not good, just because it's more processed than it was before, um, I think is a is a faulty argument. Um, you can say it's not good because I don't like the taste, or it's not good because we're importing our whey protein concentrate from China where there aren't as good food safety standards and maybe it's killing babies. Like you can say things like that and those are valid arguments, but to say like the concept of American cheese is a bad concept because it's processed, um, I, think, I think that comes from a position of not knowing what processed means <laughs> and then not realizing that food evolves and does change. I might even go farther out on a limb and say that I think one of the most delicious things there is to drink is Coca-Cola. <laughs> um, it's a fantastic drink, it's really good. I think probably all of us could agree that maybe the, the business practices of Coca-Cola are not where we'd like to come down as human beings, and that it's not a healthy thing to drink often or even perhaps rarely. Um, and that like, it, it, if you wanna talk about processed, like that's, that, that Coca-Cola may well be the apotheosis of human technology. <laughs> um, Velveeta, Velveeta. Velveeta, okay, okay. So, so not, not apotheosis. <laughs> what's the, the what, what's second, is there a penultimate apotheosis? Is there a? <laughs> I don't know what the second to apothe the apotheosis secondary is, but um, and yet it's quite delicious, and I think that sort of I I I I I think about that kind of a lot, especially when I'm drinking Coca-Cola about what that means for <laughs> what we think about processed and what's authentic, what's authentic because like authentic Coca-Cola, and that may well that may be what's behind the Mexican Coke thing, where it's like well if it's got real sugar in it, that's obviously better Coca-Cola, like sort of a weird. Right, Pure, yeah. Yeah, pure, more pure, yeah, more authentic yeah, exactly. Coca-Cola somehow. It's like, well, if you really want authentic Coca-Cola, you know what it used to have in it. <laughs> right. We uh, have like time it's, for it's one more question. And afterwards, we'll need to clear the room, but there'll be um, a chance to talk to the authors in the lobby and um, book purchases. So this is our last question. Sorry. Um, hey, I'm not a scientist either. Um, I'm a research chef. I work in product development, and I'm just curious. Uh, Pulse flowers, crickets, mealless proteins. What do you think we'll be eating 15 years from now? We'll be eating 15 years from now. Um, you all look delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's people. <laughs> um, I, well, in 15 years, we'll still be eating meat, probably a lot more of it than, than we should be. Like when we're eating more meat than we should be right now, and I, I think that's a trend that's not, at least on an average global scale. In, in Berkeley, you'll probably be eating less meat than you do right now. Um, uh, but on a global scale, we'll be eating way more meat than we're eating now. Um, I mean, 15 years is a pretty small timeline. Um, but, but yeah, at some, at some point, we're going to have to develop either um, more efficient ways of raising animals, um, and, and hopefully more efficiency doesn't come with also with more cruelty. Um, or, or some kind of synthetic thing, you know? Because, like, honestly, it's like, does, does someone eating the, the hamburger from McDonald's, like, care about the story behind the, the, the cow there? Um, um, in, in, in as much as they want to make sure that, it, that, it, that it, people say they wanted to have been humanely raised, probably. They care about that part of the story. But they don't care which specific ranch it came from. Um, and, and, and the meat doesn't taste like it came from a specific... That's actually their whole formula. It tastes the same no matter what part of the world you're in, no matter where the beef is coming from. Like, it tastes the same. So if you can synthesize that beef... Um, and, and, and somehow convince 
um, everyone in the world that it's safe and um, and it tastes the same, then you know, at, at some point I think that we will cross that line, or I mean, or or we're all going to be screwed because <laughs> we can't we can't keep eating the way we're eating um, and continuing to grow in population. I have hopes for some for for new um, crops, for for bet for things that are perennial instead of um, seasonal, and for plants that we don't currently think of as being a large commercial crop, you know, sort of ground nut type stuff. I'm hopeful for those kind of things. And I think that a lot more of what we eat is going to be genetically modified. I think we're going to start doing a lot of that. And I, th I think we won't have a choice if we want to keep feeding the planet because of climate change and because of changing conditions and more people who want it. The, I mean, the other side, the other side of that we're, is we're never going to reach an equilibrium, right? Like humans, humans have this way of whatever resources we have um, and whatever technology we have, we, we push it a little bit beyond where it should go and then we continuously have to find new ways. I mean, I think any animal will do that actually, but you, we, we're gonna continue. It's, it's gonna be a continuous struggle. We're never gonna be at the point where it's like, we finally have enough food for everybody <laughs> and we can do what we want. Um, it's not gonna happen. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I wanted to, um, Thanks, John. yeah, just thank these guys, um, Adam Rogers and um, Kenji, um, for like producing really amazing books. Um, so, anyway, thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks.